Hello and welcome everyone to this video podcast on chromosomes. Now in the first podcast for this for this chapter, we talked about the structure of the chromosome and we talked about risk factors for chromosomal abnormalities and ways to test for it. In this podcast, we're going to start getting into the actual atypical chromosome syndromes. And I'd like to begin with this diagram, which we've drawn once or twice or maybe a hundred times. But remember, you start off life as the zygotes. You go through these various stages. Remember, you form this morula, which is this big ball of cells. And then that moves into this blastocyst, where you start to form this inner cell mass, which then ultimately becomes the, the baby. And then you go through gastrulation where you start forming tissues and ultimately it implants on the uterine wall and ultimately it develops into a fully formed being. Now for this to happen an amazing set of events has to occur and it has to occur at the right time and the right genes have to be turned on and it's almost like an orchestra where everything has to be fine-tuned and ready to roll, so to speak. Any deviations can lead to a spontaneous abortion. And when we start thinking about atypical chromosomes, it's important to remember that any time the chromosome number or chromosome content changes, we run the risk of having this pathway blocked. In fact, we know that greater than 50% of known spontaneous abortions are due to a chromosomal abnormality. And this is just of the known spontaneous abortions. There's a lot of spontaneous abortions that occur that the mother never knew she was pregnant. We also know that only about 0.65%, so less than a percent of newborns have atypical chromosomes. So because of this, and the fact that so many we know are lost during development, there is apparently a pretty efficient screening mechanism that we don't completely understand, but it stops the development of, of most embryos that have formed that have atypical chromosomes. Now I want to begin our discussion of the different kinds of atypical chromosomes. And I'm going to divide them up into two categories, and then we're going to spend more time talking about each individually. And the first category is going to be chromosome numbers. First, let's define what a euploid is. A euploid has the typical chromosome number. So for humans, that would be 46. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. We also have a case known as a polyploid. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about, poly about polyploids, but let's introduce it here. Polyploids have an additional chromosome set. So usually we have two copies of each chromosome. So that is, as we set up here, 23 times two. A polyploid might have three copies of each chromosome. So that would be 23, in humans anyhow, it would be 23 times 3, which would result in 69 chromosomes. And same thing with 4. You could have 4 copies of each chromosome, and so that would be 23 times 3, or 92 chromosomes. And we're going to come back to this in a moment. And then you have aneuploids. Aneuploids have fewer or greater the number of chromosomes compared to the euploid. Now for our purposes, amongst the aneuploids, we're only going to talk about trisomies and monosomies. A trisomy has one extra. And we'll talk about some examples of trisomies in, in a little bit. So an individual who is a trisomy, they will have 47 chromosomes. They have the euploid remembers 46, one extra would be 47. So for instance, Down syndrome has one extra chromosome, 21. So they would have 47 chromosomes, they'd be a trisomy. 
monosomy is one fewer chromosomes. And so these individuals would have 45 chromosomes. Now what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about polyploids and aneuploids. And then I'm going to go in and talk just a little bit more about things that are not chromosomal number problems, but chromosomal structural problems. But let's start with polyploids. So polyploids. So remember, a polyploid has one or more extra sets of chromosomes. Unlike aneuploids, polyploids have an extra chromosome of each chromosome. So for instance, instead of having two of every chromosome, they might have three or four of every chromosome. For the most part, when we think of polyploids in humans, most that we detect are triploids. Now a few things about triploids. The first is that triploids are lethal in humans. So would a tetraploid or a pentaploid, anything beyond two copies is lethal in humans. Sometimes you might have a live birth. So let's just write rarely a live birth. But that live birth does not survive very long, just a matter of days at most. And you see major organ failure in every single organ. How do they form? Most often they form, and probably two thirds of the time, form when you have a single egg fertilized by two sperm. Usually when one sperm fertilizes an egg, it shuts down the ability for an additional sperm to fertilize the egg. But rarely, two get in. And when that happens, you have 23 chromosomes from this sperm, 23 chromosomes from this sperm, and then you had 23 chromosomes in the egg, so you'd have a total of 69 chromosomes. That's usually how they form. So the other third of triploids form most often when you have an egg and a sperm, and one of these has 23 chromosomes like it should, and the other had an error during meiosis where they didn't separate the chromosomes and they have 46 chromosomes. But this also would result in a zygote that had 69 chromosomes. Now apparently this happens more frequently than one might think because triploids, i just put that up here, account for about 15 to 20% of all spontaneous abortions. So that's a pretty high number. A couple other things about polyploids or triploids I want to say is that even though I said that they're lethal in humans, interestingly enough, the liver, which based on other studies and other characteristics is just a, a really interesting organ. Um, but we know in the liver there are many cells that are polyploid. Triploid, tetraploid, various sources. There's a lot of hypotheses as to why that's important or why that's allowed to happen in livers and not other organs. But one idea of why it happens is that the liver itself is a pretty toxic environment. So it's not surprising that the cells in the liver are going to be exposed to more toxins than other cells in the body and therefore those chromosomes may accumulate damage because of those toxins. And then throughout evolution, since the liver is a pretty important organ, our bodies have selected a way that allows those cells to tolerate such polyploids and maybe even function better as polyploids. We don't really know for sure though. Now outside of humans, so other life forms, we do see polyploids. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one example in mammals. So most of them exist in non-mammals and most are plants. They can occur naturally to be polyploids, or we make them polyploids. And the reason we might do that is that polyploids are sterile, and so therefore they don't make seeds. So any seedless fruit you eat is a polyploid. Strawberries, they don't have seeds in them or on them. And they, ha they are octoploids. They have eight copies of all the chromosomes. Bananas, we should be thankful that there are not huge seeds within a banana, but they're usually full of seeds. But what we eat, there are no seeds, and that's because they are polyploids. That is, they're sterile. Okay, let's go ahead and move our attention 
to aneuploids. Now remember, an aneuploid is a cell with one more or one fewer chromosomes. When it's a cell with one more chromosome, we call that a trisomy. In humans, somebody who is a trisomy, they have a total of 47 chromosomes. And we've mentioned this before, just to remind you. And we know that in humans, when there's somebody with one fewer chromosome, we call that a monosomy. So in humans, that would be someone with 45 chromosomes. There are some variations to this, but these would be the two categories that we talk about for this class. Now, I'm showing this karyotype here, which we've seen before, but to remind you, it's showing all 22 pairs of autosomes and then the one pair of sex chromosomes. So these cells came from someone who is male because you see an X and a Y chromosome. So a question that might pop up as you're thinking about this is, for a trisomy to go from two chromosomes to three chromosomes, you're only increasing the number of genes by one chromosome. Everything else is the same, so why is it by having these extra genes on this one chromosome, why would that cause a problem? Because remember, I said they're usually lethal, so it must cause a problem, but why? Likewise, one might think if you go from having two copies of a chromosome in a euploid, and you lose one of those, and now the cell is a monosomy, you still have one good copy of all those genes. So why is it that this is a problem? So I want to remind you that in humans, there are approximately 23,000 genes, give or take. Turns out that some of these genes, so some genes, can't tolerate over or under expression. And by over and under expression, I mean being trisomic or monosomic. Because remember, trisomic, that's having more of those genes. Monosomy is having fewer of those genes. So some genes can't tolerate having even one extra copy of that gene or having one fewer copy of that gene. Remember, we should consider genomic imprinting as well. So let's say you had these two chromosomes. And for the sake of argument, let's say there's a, a gene right here that is gen genomically imprinted. So maybe the copy we get from dad, the paternal copy, is expressed. But the copy from mom is not expressed. And in this example, we'll assume that the gene is essential, that you need that gene to be expressed. And so if you lose one of these chromosomes, that could be a problem. If you lost this chromosome, just considering this one gene, that would be less of a problem because that gene's not expressed. But if you lost the chromosome on the left, and now you're losing this gene that is expressed on this chromosome, because it's not expressed over here, and so now you're no longer able to make this gene work because it's gone now. So genomic imprinting could get rid of imprinted genes. And I guess to complicate matters even more, there might be a second imprinted gene on this chromosome. And maybe in this case, the maternal one is expressed and the mater paternal one from dad is not expressed. So in this case, you really can't lose either of these chromosomes because in one case, you're going to eliminate this top gene and in the other case, you're going to eliminate this bottom gene. So you really need both. And this one here, I'm going to put balance of proteins is important. Not for all proteins, but for some it is. And so let me explain what I mean by that. And so we'll draw our two chromosomes here, and we'll make genes here. These are different genes. These aren't the, Im the imprinted genes I was just talking about. And usually in a cell, using this as our example, both genes are working, and both genes make a protein. It's transcribed and it's translated and you have these two proteins. And in some cases, as in this hypothetical case here, having too few proteins isn't sufficient. Or too many isn't sufficient to do a particular job in the cell. These two proteins, maybe they're over here 
and they have to be in a concentration where they interact with each other, but you never reach that critical concentration if one of these is mutated. Or if you have an extra chromosome here, maybe having three of these at the same time causes the protein to be non-functional. So there are many examples of where having the correct concentration of proteins is essential for those cells to function properly. Having too few or too many by having a trisomy or a monosomy causes problems. Now, as I said in the beginning of this, I, I said most aneuploids are lethal. That implies that some survive. So I'm going to talk about which ones could survive and, and uh, which ones would never make it to a live birth. Now I'm going to focus on this karyotype that maybe you've been wondering why I've had it just sitting here. Well, this is a karyotype from a cell that has the correct number of chromosomes. And what I'd like to do is indicate approximately how many genes are on each of these chromosomes. I'm going to write them down first and then we'll talk about them. All right, now let's consider these numbers I just wrote here. You can write these down if you want, or you can just write some trends, because I'm not going to ask you to tell me exactly how many genes are on each chromosome. But I do want you to consider that some of the larger chromosomes have the most genes on it. Some of the smaller chromosomes have fewer genes on them. It's not a perfect relationship, but in general, the longer chromosomes have more genes on them. So now, considering these trends here, I want you to think about this question. And this question, I'm only going to be thinking about trisomy of autosomes. We'll talk about sex chromosomes in a moment. So this is the question. Which chromosomes are more likely to be found as a trisomy in a live birth? And again, look at everything except X and Y here. Which ones are most likely going to? And I'm going to give you a hint. There are three of them. And so you might look at this and you might say, well, let's start with the three lowest number of genes. 13 has few genes on it. 18 also has relatively few genes on it, as does chromosome 21. Those are the three chromosomes with the fewest genes on it. And consequently, are the only three trisomies that can survive to birth. So let's list those now. Trisomy 13, 18, and 21 can survive to birth. Now usually they don't. Usually a trisomy 13, three copies of 13, or three copies of 18, or trisomy 21, three copies of chromosome 21, don't survive to birth and they die during embryonic or fetal development. And the reason they survive is because it's less likely that they're going to have a gene that causes a, a failed development. So again, 13, 18, 21 survive or can survive because they don't have a lot of genes on them and the genes they do have on them, they're more likely to tolerate being a trisomy. So the next thing I wanna ask is about monosomies of still autosomes. And so the question is which of these would more likely tolerate having only one chromosome? And the answer is there are no examples of a surviving monosomy in the autosomes. So one copy only of any of these chromosomes, one through 22, results in a spontaneous abortion. Something else I should say is that we know that trisomies and monosomies, even though they don't survive, occur in each of these chromosomes. They just lead to spontaneous abortions. The only example of that, and it might not be surprising by looking at its size, is chromosome 1. Chromosome 1, as a trisomy or as a monosomy, is never seen in a spontaneous abortion. I'm not saying they never form. I'm just saying we've never seen evidence of it. So what would a karyotype look like of someone with trisomy 21? Well, I have misplaced my karyotype of trisomy 21, 
But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this karyotype into that. So there's going to be 47 chromosomes, and you're going to have an extra chromosome 21. So you should know trisomy 21 has three copies, and you should also know that trisomy 21 has the name of Down syndrome. Now a few things about Down syndrome. You can look in your book or online and you can read about all the different symptoms and traits someone with Down syndrome has, but what I'd like you to know mainly is that they have quite variable traits. One person with Down syndrome might need to be institutionalized or in a hospital their whole life because they can't take care of themselves, while someone else with Down syndrome might be able to hold a steady job, maybe has finished high school, maybe has taken a, a few college classes. So there's a variable range of traits. So not every child with Down syndrome is every child. We know that the life expectancy is 60 years. It used to be nine years back in the early 1900s. And it's not because we developed a, a cure for Down syndrome, it's because we're better at treating the, these variable symptoms of someone with Down syndrome. The sequence genome has helped us understand Down syndrome better. Some of the genes on chromosome 21 are linked to leukemia. So that tells us why children who have Down syndrome are more likely to get leukemia. Some of the genes on 21 are linked to immunity. And so by changing the number of those genes, it explains why people with Down syndrome have a much more severe reaction to influenza or the flu. One of the genes on chromosome 21 we know is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Which explains why people with Down syndrome have a 25% risk factor of developing Alzheimer's disease while others only have about a 6% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So understanding which genes are on chromosome 21 really has led to a much better understanding of the traits someone with Down syndrome has and it allows us to treat some of those traits more efficiently than we could have, say, 100 years ago. Next, let's look at trisomy 18. And in this karyotype of someone with trisomy 18, you can see each of the chromosomes are all the same size to each other, and they have the proper numbers of them, except for 18, where we see three copies of 18. Trisomy 18 is commonly referred to as Edwards syndrome. So I'm not going to ask you to know a lot about trisomy 18, except that it is chromosome 18. It's known as Edwards syndrome. But you should also know that the symptoms and the traits of trisomy 18 are so severe that usually an individual does not survive fetal development and are usually spontaneously aborted early during pregnancy. The few that do survive, less than 5% survive for one year. And those that survive longer than one year don't usually survive for more than two or three years. There are some that survive longer, and they're what we call mosaics. And we'll talk about mosaics in just a moment. This is just a tease. Next, let's talk about trisomy 13, shown in this karyotype. And it's commonly referred to as Patel syndrome. All the chromosomes are typical, except for chromosome 13, where you have three copies of chromosome 13. It's similar in many ways as trisomy 18. Most individuals with trisomy 13 don't survive embryonic or fetal development, and they are lost during spontaneous abortions. Those that do survive, just like with trisomy 18, have less than a 5% chance of surviving the first year. Same as with trisomy 18, those that do survive that first year usually don't survive for more than another year or two. And then the cases of mosaics, as we'll talk about in a moment, can survive a little longer than that. Now I'd like to spend some time talking about aneuploids of the sex chromosomes. We spent most of our time 
talking about chromosomes 1 through 22, but now I'm going to talk about the X and the Y chromosome. So in talking about sex chromosomes, one big difference between sex chromosome aneuploids and autosome aneuploids is that sex chromosome trisomy and monosomies survive and are usually healthy. So the question then is, why is that? The autosomes don't do very well when we have extra chromosomes or fewer chromosomes, but we can have three X chromosomes. We can have two X and one Y. We can have one X and two Ys. We can also have a monosomy where we just have an X chromosome, and typically we call that XO. Why is that? Well, there's two main reasons for this that we should at least briefly mention. The first is X inactivation. If you have three copies of the X chromosome shown here, we know that two of those X chromosomes become bar bodies. And so somebody who is XXX, so we'll just write that down here, XXX or XXY or XX or XY all express one X chromosome's worth of proteins, of genes. So it doesn't really matter how many X chromosomes you have because it's always going to inactivate all of them except for one. Likewise, I should put this here as well, XO. It wouldn't inactivate any of those X chromosomes. They all express one X chromosome. So X inactivation protects against sex chromosome aneuploids. And the other reason is that the Y chromosome is puny, almost embarrassingly puny. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to carry one with me. It's so small. There are only 50 genes on it. And so if you have an extra copy of the Y chromosomes, it really doesn't matter. Or if you lack that Y chromosome, there are some symptoms, there are some phenotypes associated with it, but there's so few genes on it, it doesn't really matter too much. Sad but true. Now, what I'd like to do over the next couple whiteboards is I want to talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. Well, actually all of them in a little bit more detail. Okay, let's begin this discussion of the different sex chromosome aneuploids that you need to know about. And let's begin our discussion with XO, also known as Turner's syndrome. And you should know it as both. This also turns out to be the only viable monosomy. There are no viable monosomies in regards to the autosomes. And of the sex chromosomes, only XO is possible. And remember, the O isn't a chromosome. That's just a placeholder. There's no chromosome there. YO, just only the Y chromosome, would not work because the X chromosome contains so many essential genes. Now, if an amniocentesis is done or a CVS test is done, then a parent might know their child would be born with Turner syndrome. However, at birth, if they didn't do the karyotype, they probably wouldn't know because there are no overall obvious symptoms at birth. The karyotype, of course, would only have one X chromosome and no Y chromosome and all other chromosomes would be typical. If you'd like, you can look up some more of the symptoms of Turner syndrome on your own. I won't ask specific symptoms except for what I tell you here. So at birth, as I said, there's very few symptoms. They might be a little, they might be a little heavier, but in general you wouldn't know. But they do lag in sexual development. And as far as sexual development is concerned, what happens is they don't ovulate or menstruate. Their uterus is also poorly developed. And as a result, they are almost always sterile. In addition to lagging in sexual development, they also are typically shorter in stature. If a parent knows that their child has Turner syndrome, hormone therapy can help. It won't necessarily help with not being sterile, but it can help maximize their height, and it can also help in the development of secondary sexual characteristics 
such as breast development. I should also point out that people with Turner syndrome have typical intelligence. In fact, one of the leading geneticists that studies Turner syndrome, she herself has Turner syndrome. Now let's talk about the other extreme of the X chromosome. When you have three copies of the X chromosome, and this is just commonly referred to as triplo X. Now typically, someone who is triplo X will have typical intelligence, might not appear to be as intelligent as their siblings, but it's really hard to know if that is some sort of social context with the knowledge that they have this syndrome. Maybe, maybe there's not really any intellectual disadvantages, but maybe they're treated differently. So it's always kind of hard to get at this question of intelligence. They do tend to be taller, and they do have menstrual irregularities. They aren't necessarily sterile. They typically can, can have children. But if you met someone on the street and they were triplo X, you wouldn't know. Because remember, two of these X chromosomes would be inactive. Okay, let's consider the XXY, where you have two X chromosomes and one Y, y chromosome. And here you see that on this karyotype, everything looks typical except two X chromosomes here and one Y chromosome here. Now this is the first sex chromosome aneuploid that we're talking about where the individual would present as being male. Turner syndrome and triplo X, since they lacked the Y chromosome, they would have been typically raised as females. Someone who is XXY, they are referred to as having Kleinfelder's syndrome. As with the other sex chromosome aneuploids we discussed, someone with Kleinfelder's syndrome would have typical intelligence. There's a good chance if you saw somebody with Kleinfelder's, you wouldn't know they had Kleinfelder's. Now, as they develop, they, they tend to be taller. They tend to have longer arms and longer legs. Their testes and prostate gland, which is important in semen production, are underdeveloped. They either have no or little pubic hair and often have larger breast tissue. Now, because the testes and prostate glands are underdeveloped, typically someone with Kleinfelder syndrome is sterile. Some in vitro fertilization studies have shown that there can be success at helping them have children, but usually it doesn't work. In fact, the main genetic or chromosomal cause of male infertility is that the person has Kleinfelder syndrome. All right, this last one I want to talk about is X, Y, Y. One X chromosome, two Y chromosomes. This is named Jacob's syndrome. As we saw with our other sex chromosome aneuploids, they would be predicted to have typical intelligence. They typically are larger. And because they're larger, and, and in some cases develop faster than someone else, sometimes it's been shown in some psychological studies that they're treated differently. And because of that, people with Jacob syndrome has some, have sometimes been, and because of that, there have been some who have mischaracterized individuals with Jacob syndrome as having intelligence, psychological, and aggressive tendencies. When those studies are done in a more scientific way, most of those previous findings fall away. Except for the fact that sometimes when somebody looks a little different, unfortunately, different expectations are placed upon that person. And so sometimes people with Jacob syndrome do struggle because of that, but, but by and large, it's probably more to do with the people around them and not necessarily the person with Jacob syndrome. Now, one final symptom of Jacob syndrome that you should be aware of is that they sometimes can be infertile. The other sex chromosome aneuploids that we talked about are almost always associated with infertility. In Jacob's syndrome, it, it's not quite as strong of a symptom but they do have a higher risk of being infertile. Well, this is a convenient place to stop this video podcast. In this video podcast, we continued our discussion of chromosomes, but focus more on what happens when you have extra copies or when you have fewer copies of the, those chromosomes. In the next and final podcast for this general topic of chromosomes, 
we're going to talk about what happens that leads to these alterations in chromosomes and we're going to talk about how chromosomes can be altered in their structure that can lead to phenotypes. If you have any questions at all at this point, please make sure you let me know. If not, I'll see you on the next podcast. Bye for now.